sources. Now here's how we can understand normal and oblique uh, diffraction um, when we're both perpendicular to the edge and when we're at oblique incidence. If we're perpendicular to the edge, we have constructive addition from the edge currents along the entire edge, resulting in a strong per perpendicular backscatter. And again, this very small contribution from the corner edge currents. But perpendicular to the edge, the scattering is strong and in all directions. For oblique incidents, for oblique diffractions, here we have an incident ray coming in in red. In oblique, we have the Keller cone. And again, we have the uh, canceling, uh, the destructive interference cancels, that edge current cancels. And for near grazing angles, the current may be um, very significant, and there'll be strong scattering along the Keller cone. And the co those coefficients in the equation for the Keller cone, uh, the, for the uh, the x's and the y's, uh, come out differently for um, the, the, uh, the Keller's work, and then for Euphemstuf's work. And other people have come out with other unified models, and it goes on and on. You know, squeezing out the, the, the last fractions of a dB. This gives you a nice physical example of what happens if we have a thin, flat plate, and we have a plane wave coming in at an angle, and the E-field, and this is uh, the, the plate here. Now, what you see is the uh, neg neg negligible scattering from the front edge, the electric field, uh, normal and continuous. Now the traveling waves, see the traveling waves coming down on either side of the plate. They have to bend in so that they are perpendicular to the plate. That's what the boundary conditions. The surface uh, field on the top has to bend in and be perpendicular. But because of the angle it's coming in, the surface wave, the traveling wave on the bottom, has to bend in but backwards. And you see they get out of phase as things move down. And so that when we get to the end, where there's no, um, no more, the field is, there's an induced edge current right at this end, and there's a diffractive field. And this would be, if this were a wing, this would be diffraction from the trailing edge caused by a component of electric field that was along the, uh, the direction of, of that plane wave. Not its direction of orientation, but parallel. Now, if the electric field is perpendicular out of the view graph, then we have a different case. Uh, we have an induced edge current in the front and diffracted if uh, fields at the edge here where the electric field is coming is going into the board so we have an induced current edge current here and we'll see a diffracted field at the edge and the since the field is coming out uh, n cross e will always be zero coming down and then at the end, the electric field, is there's no edge diffraction at the back edge because the electric field is pretty close to zero. So that gives you a physical understanding about how leading edge diffraction and, and trailing edge diffraction works. Now what I'm going to do is go back to the case where um, we have, uh, we're going to show you leading edge diffraction, and then we're going to show you uh, trailing edge diffraction. Okay, and this is for the case where the electric field polarization EY is plotted. And this will give us leading edge diffraction. The E is coming out. And it's at 15 degrees, 4 meters. Okay, now let's click on it. And you'll see here's the electric field coming in. And we ought to see some nice leading edge diffraction here. Bingo! There, there's that leading edge diffraction. It's flipped in sign, but it's there.
quite nicely. Okay? And it's a significant um, magnitude but opposite amplitude. Now let's look at it one more time so you can see it. Um, too many equations. It's nice to have a view graph. It just shows you a movie. This is the, the incident plane wave. The field's coming out. And we have the diffraction around the leading edge of this wing. Now these simulations, again, were done with a, um, the finite difference time domain method. Okay, now let's, uh, we'll plot the edge field coming out. So the E field is in the plane. And here we're going to see trailing edge deflection, excuse me, trailing edge diffraction. So we're going to see here some nice stuff. I'll click on it, and in will come our plane wave. The K direction is here. And it's pretty mild right there, just a little bit, but it doesn't come out like gangbusters. But when we get down the end here, all oh, heck is going to break loose. Better, or I'm in trouble. There. So now we have some nice um, trailing edge diffraction coming out. Okay. So now let's look back at our famous 15 by 15 centimeter plate, 10 gigahertz polarization. Here we have the, uh, the measurement, and, uh, and it looks I'm colorblind. This could be either purple or blue. It's probably just blue. And, uh, and in black, we've got the physical theory of diffraction, which gives quite good agreement. And, of course, we have the physical optics approximation all by itself. So you can see that adding in the physical theory of diffraction gives us a much more accurate uh, uh, estimate of the calculate of the uh, radar cross section with that square plate. Okay, well then when we go to the that uh, Johnson generic aircraft model, which has flat edges and cylinders and cones and things like that, um, I hope if you're looking at um, a black and white copy of a PDF, you won't see this. It'd be good to go back to the to the actual view graphs on your computer if you have them or if you're viewing this. You'll see that um, quite nicely um, the rat scat measurements, that the measurements that were taken on this are in um, black. Yes, they're in black. Yeah, very, very good agreement. Well, first of all, not let's not talk about agreement. We see the end cap quite nicely. And we see the fuselage specular and the cone specular, they come in nice. And, uh, and the leading and trailing edges come in quite nicely. And then we see the same as we go, this is from a hundred, minus 180 to zero, and this is zero to 180. But you see here some departure down at, remember this has got a 70 dB dynamic range of the RCS. For the physical theory of diffraction, it still leaves a little bit to be desired down in this level. So for a relatively simple a model of a, a generic aircraft model, this is just a flat plate for a wing. It hasn't got any wedge shape to it and flat plates out here. It's perfect cylinder and no cockpit, just a perfect cone. Um, you can see that you get pretty darn good agreement but it's not perfect. And what that says is there's still an awful lot to learn with, other than these five core models, which I'll call. And some of the more significant models, yeah, um, I mentioned about that proceedings of the IEEE. There have been an awful lot of papers published in the IEEE proceedings on antennas and, and probably, you know, for, the, for these uh, 
and these kinds of uh, calculations and the proceedings and transactions of, of even the IEEE and many international journals trying to get from more even more complicated um, shapes than these the exact cross sections. Now let's look at a comparison of the different methodologies that we've talked about. These two exact methods and then these four methods that are approximate and useful at very at, uh, in the optical region. Okay, now for exact techniques, they, they work with limited geometries and they'll work on all phenomena. And we have uh, classical solutions. With, there are a few geometries that you can get exact, like the sphere. We ha they have numerical methods. They're computationally slow, like the method of moments. And these guys tend to work only at low frequency where there aren't many facets and things like that. And then you can also have hybrid methods, which use both the method of moments. And this is another a theory of diffraction and, and physical optics and geometrical optics. And, and then these develop from integral equation techniques, the method of moments and the other integral equation techniques and hybrid methods of these different ones. And then there's a, a number of different finite element techniques. I've just mentioned the finite difference time domain method. Now, for approximate techniques that are valid only at high frequencies, they're computationally quite speedy, but they have limited phenomena that they'll be able to deal with. They feed back also into the hybrid techniques. And we have, we have two kinds, surface integral techniques. Um, they're computationally slow, but they'll work on all geometries like physical optics and uh, physical theory of diffraction. And then ray tracing techniques that are computationally slow and will work at all geometries. And they are the GO, GTD, and then the universal theory of diffraction, which I haven't gotten into. And then one called shooting and bouncing rays. So you can see there's a large number in this family tree of different uh, RCS prediction techniques. Now if we look at comparing the four, dif four different main techniques, the FTTD, method of moments, and geometrical optics, with and without the theory of diffraction, and the same with physical optics. Let's look at the issue of calculating the current. It, what we do is we solve the exact partial differential equation with this enhancing and time stepping. Method of moments is exact, and we solve the integral equation, but we've got to have plenty of very small, you know, lambda over 8, uh, pieces that we make up as our model for it to be exact. And the geometrical optics, geometrical theory of diffraction, it's based on specular point reflections and we look at the edge currents at when it's the geometrical theory of diffraction. And likewise, we look at edge currents here and we've got for physical optics, sort of the vanilla form of physical optics and physical theory of diffraction, we of course have used the tang tangent plane approximation. The phenomena that are considered in, in the first two exact ones are all, uh, we use a ray tracing method for geometrical optics and GTD, and reflections, uh, single and double, uh, we consider those uh, in, in, in diffraction. And the, the computational requirements uh, the, uh, time stepping and FTTD and uh, matrix inversion is the big bear and multiple fractions and diffraction and then surface integration and shadowing are issues with the computational. Now let's look at the good, the good, the, the, the good and the ugly. You know, uh, these two methods are exact and vi these, this is at superb. At, at vis as a visual visualization aid in giving one physical insight. As I have used them in this lecture to, to, to show you how physical phenomena like the leading and trailing edges of the wings are. The limitations are these, these are only good. These exact methods are only good at low frequencies. The complex geometries are difficult 
And this is only calculated a single angle of incidence. Uh, and uh, the method of moments is for a single frequency. It, low frequencies are only, I said, and the formulation is difficult for uh, when you have uh, different materials. That, and um, for the geometrical optics and geomet GTD, these are only high frequency methods, canonical geometries only, and you have caustics. That's where uh, a whole bunch of rays come out in one direction at a time, or they all hit one place. They give you computational problems on physical things, unwieldy things. High frequency only again here, and many phenomena are neglected. Now, I, one thing I didn't mention are corner reflectors, and we see them all over the place. Any of you who sail, uh, this is a picture taking of us from a sailboat, see this little gizmo up on a, a line up to the mast, and what it does is it gives a very, very large reflection over a wide range of angles. So you have a very high cross-section, and it's used as a test target for radar calibration, or you can put it on a sailboat, so the sailboat looks a thousand times bigger, hundreds times bigger. And you can make them in different shapes, dihedrals, trihedrals, and the trihedrals can be square, triangular, circular. And you see here's one, a dihedral corner reflector, where we have in blue uh, the uh, reflecting surface. And all rays that come in go back out and you'll see them. And broadside incidence, here's the, cr the uh, cross section. You look at the effective area you've got here. It's 4 pi over the effective area divided by lambda squared. And it's the area of the projected aperture on the incident ray and used with a physical optics model to calculate that. And see what you do is since you have this, uh, you have one of these reflectors on all sides somewhere you're going to have broadside or darn close to broadside. So if you were looking in, uh, you're, you're going to end up with a good cross-section. And well, that's what these are used for. So let's talk in summary here, summarize all this. The target RCS depends on its characteristics and the radar parameters. It's, it's a lot of things it depends on, size, shape, material orientation frequency, polarization, range, and the viewing angle. The RCS is due to many different scattering centers. They can be from structural aspects of the target, from propulsion, uh, those geometrical aspects, and from the avionics, antennas, and things that it's calculating. These can be propellers from engines or, or the uh, inlets from jet, uh, jet inlets. And the RCS calculation tools, many of them are available. And they take account many different electromagnetic mechanisms present. And the prediction and measurement techniques are very synergistic. You can measure to anchor the predictions, and then the predictions will validate your measurements so that you can go back and forth and really understand the RCS. But now here are the uh, references. I've got a lot of references. Here's Gene Knott's uh, work at our tech house. And uh, um, Bob Atkins gave a tutorial for the IEEE. And I've used some of his material. I've uh, re-rendered it. So there wasn't a, but I want to reference Bob. And, and uh, also in Skolnick's Introduction to Radar Systems, his handbook has a chapter I referenced. I used and uh, re-rendered a lot, re read all the material that Eugene has done on uh, this material. I read a lot of his book. And then also I'd like to acknowledge both Bob Shin, Atkins, ha Shohan, and Audrey Dumanian, and Seth uh, Kaspolsky. And here's some homework problems for you. Uh, a couple from, from Skolnick, a couple from Lebanon. I thought this might be an interesting one for you.